This podcast is brought to you by Blackbee Ministries International. To find out more, visit blackbee.org. Welcome back to the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. This week we have a special guest, a friend of Richard's on the program. He is a rather unique individual because he is a fiction writer, but also uh, a pastor. It's Dr. Marcus Buckley, and he focuses his ministry on making the Bible relevant and easy to understand. He's the lead pastor of Oasis Church in Ormond Beach, Florida. Marcus is a graduate of Stinson University, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and North Greenville University. He and his wife, Leanne, have two daughters and a son. Uh, it's a real fascinating uh, conversation that he has with Richard. And uh, we'll leave links, as always, to to his information, but also to the books uh, that are mentioned um, in this podcast. So with that, I'll turn it over to Richard. Well, for those of you that uh, follow this podcast, you know that uh, we try to do different things uh, from week to week. And one of the the special things I get to do is just to interview uh, leaders that I have met in the business world, in the church world, uh, people that are just doing some creative things. And uh, so I've got a special guest uh, today, uh, Marcus Buckley, who's a pastor and uh, also an author and uh, also does many other things that you'll hear about here shortly. But um, I want to, I, I like sometimes just to drop in with some folks who are doing some interesting things and uh, hopefully it perhaps kind of sparks some of uh, our listeners imaginations about perhaps what God would want to do with them as well. And so, Marcus, uh, welcome today to our podcast. Thank you. Great to be with you. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what, what you do, where, where you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm a lead pastor at Oasis Church in Ormond Beach, Florida. Uh, this is, um, I've been here five years at this church, and Ormond Beach is, is where I grew up. Uh, So it was really kind of neat to get to come back here. Before here, we were in Greer, South Carolina, where you and I actually met. um, I was working on my uh, doctoral uh, program at North Greenville University. Oh, plug for North Greenville there too, I guess. Um, uh, You were one of my professors, and so that's where we connected. We were in the uh, upstate of South Carolina there for about 13 years. Loved it. It's just such a beautiful area up there. Uh, But the Lord led us back to a church here about five years ago, and it was kind of neat getting to come home, the place you grew up to, you know, yeah, it, it, how, how in is some that? ways it had changed, some ways it had You know, Jesus said well, was, a, it, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Is that, um, <laughs> what, what's that your experience been? Out in, in, it hasn't played out entirely that way. It's been a pretty good experience. Um, you, you must know, have obviously had not too uh, reckless uh, uh, youth when you were growing up there then. Well, I think it was just far enough away in time. That it, <laughs> no, yeah, no, most I, I, most I, of those yeah. police officers have retired now. So they've all retired. That's yeah. all retired. You know, and, that, and that's the thing. I was, um, uh, and and I was, you know, my whole childhood from second grade on up. We were here at Ormond Elementary and Ormond uh, Middle School, Seabreeze High School. I went to Stetson University, about thirty minutes from here. And so I had a lot of friends. And when I came back, a lot of those same friends were still here. Uh, and a lot of the same connections. So a lot of folks had moved on or other things, but it was it was still neat to be able to, in a lot of senses, pick up the way it was. Because Ormond Beach is right next to Daytona, and it's a it's a small town, but uh, even as much development and growth as there had been, it's still it's still the same town it was hmm. 20, 30 years ago in a lot of ways. So hmm. it's it's been really neat to to come back. I was when we lived here before, we moved away um, a couple of years after we got married, my wife Leanne and I. Uh, we moved away from here in ninety eight. And during the mid '90s, I was, I was pastoring a church already, but I was uh, chaplain for the Volusia County Sheriff's Office. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, they found out I'd come back and said, "Hey, you want to be a chaplain again?" Um, So in in some ways, you know, some relationships like that picked picked right back up. But it's been um, because it has grown so much. It's it's been fun to find new ways to connect and and engage in the community and and find ways to. Uh, to rebuild old relationships, but there's so many new ones and, and, and so many, such a huge influx of new people all the time here in Florida that it's, yeah. uh, it, it's something new almost every week, really. Well, you're, uh, you know, you, the, the, the beauty of that is that you obviously know people there, you know how they think, you know, their viewpoints, you can, it's easy to connect. And my parents for years had a timeshare there at Ormond beach. And so that's what I remember it as that's where they would get away to vacation, uh, not yep. too far from Atlanta to drive down there, but well, Marcus, you've you've uh, 
you've done an interesting thing uh, as we were talking the other day. Um, you've you've uh, you've written a trilogy. You're two thirds of the way through your trilogy, uh, yep. and uh, it's a it, it, the first one is called "All Have Sinned," and the second one, "Labor of Fools." And uh, I, I found that uh, fascinating. I, I, I read both books. Um, and if, if someone it kind of reminded me a lot of Joel uh, Rosenberg's writing, uh, kind of a Christian perspective, but a lot of uh, action and violence and shooting and explosions. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, uh, and so the fun reads and you, you kind of leave uh, cliffhangers at the end uh especially after the second volume, uh, uh, a lot of explosions and things, and then we're left wondering how everything turns out. But, uh, and so I'm, I'm quite anxious to get to volume three now. But, uh, but I'm intrigued by this, and you have kind of an interesting story related to that because the, the series, I don't want to give away a, a lot of the story, but it's basically it, it kind of follows as a, a main character a, a former pastor that becomes an FBI agent. And uh, yes. that, that, you know, that concept at first seems kind of bizarre, a pastor uh, entering the FBI and being good with a gun and, and so on and being swept up into all kinds of uh, evil intrigues that he has to combat. But uh, but actually, in, in, uh, in, in certain ways, this story kind of follows some of your own your own journey, doesn't it? It does. I was I've been pastoring for almost six years when I was recruited by the FBI. And the FBI is actually what I had always wanted to do. I'd always wanted to be a federal agent. Um, my plan was to uh, graduate from college, get my law degree, and then go to work for the government in one of their federal agencies as uh, as an agent. And I'd, I'd always heard that a law degree was a pretty good way to do it. You know, they wanted lawyers and accountants and that sort of stuff. And so uh, I had applied right after I graduated from college, but you're supposed to have three years full-time work experience. And so I didn't have that yet. But a few years later, um, I uh, we, we had a service where we honored um, all of our local law enforcement officials. And I'd invited the special agent charge of the Jacksonville field office of the FBI to come. And he and his wife were there that day. And uh, he was there for the service and recognized and appreciated him. And then he invited me to lunch afterwards. He said, hey, I'd really like to take you to lunch. And from there, it kind of turned into him recruiting me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was a really interesting time because at, at that point, I'd already been pastoring for, for several years. My wife and I had had our first child. Um, baby two was on the way. And now, wow, here's this opportunity to go to work for the Bureau, which is what I'd always wanted to do. So I filled out the 32-page application or whatever it was. Uh, I took the phase one exam. And it was kind of cool how that happens because not everybody that applies gets to do that. They notify you and say, okay, we want you to show up and take the phase one exam at such and such a location at such and such a time. You get there, you sign non-disclosure agreements. And I'm there with uh, attorneys and police chiefs, fighter jet pilots, um, you know, and they say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, I passed the phase one exam and they tell you just because you pass phase one doesn't mean you get to the phase two written test and interview. Well, I did that too. And one of the coolest moments of my life up to that point was they said, you know, here's an airline ticket. Go and check in at the hotel. A car will take you there. When you get to the front desk, tell them what you're with the FBI. So uh -huh. I was 29 years old, and I had, I had thought I had reached the pinnacle when I walked to the front desk, and my suit and tie said, Marcus Buckley, I'm here with the FBI. You know, and they handed me the envelope with the stuff in it, the, the Bureau's logo on it. So I did that, and I passed that. Um, so – then things started getting real because then you're doing going through your top secret clearance where they interview everyone that has ever known you. Um, you have to do your drug test, your polygraph, uh, physical fitness tests. Um, I had to be able to run a mile and a half in less than 12 minutes and 30 seconds, which for a runner was no big deal. I, however, was not a runner. So mm. and my wife was, so she had to coach me through that. So all during this process, I had about a year where I was running three or four miles a day every morning. I'm pastoring a church, and I told no one knew about this. Hmm. The only person that knew was my wife. I didn't even tell my parents. I mean, this was how close hold we were keeping this. And so every day I'm running three or four miles a day. As I'm running, uh, I'm praying the whole time, um, God, what do you want me to do? And and I have to, have to say here, um, 
you and your father's work with experiencing God has been one of the biggest game changers for me. I tell everyone I know Hmm. that without hesitation, the most influential book I've ever read other than the scriptures is experiencing God because Hmm. it has helped me at so many points. So as I told you before, I want to thank you and your father and your family for, for your incredible work with that. But so as I was running, I literally was dealing with that, that fork in the road. Hmm. Um, it wasn't fully a crisis of faith, like you know, it, was, it talks about, but it was still that. You know, what do you want me to do? And I, and I finally found such comfort in saying, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, just let me be the best I can for you. If I'm going to stay a pastor, I want to be the best pastor I can be for you. If I'm going to be an FBI agent, let me be the best agent I could be. And so, um, a lot of deliberation. Well, I finally got a phone call one day from. Pastor Jim Henry, who was the pastor of First Baptist Orlando. And he had been a good friend and a mentor, but I hadn't listed him on my contacts anywhere. And they showed up at First Baptist Orlando and Mm. started asking about me. So he calls me and uh, he said, the FBI came to my office today. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I meant to to tell you I was going to share it with you. He says, no, no, no. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, they came and said, we need to talk to you about Marcus Buckley. I said, what'd you say? First thing I thought of, what did he do? <laughs> so, um, so I asked, I said, what do you, you know, what do you think? And he says, you know, well, Marcus, there's not many great FBI agents, but there's not many faithful pastors either. Hmm. And that really was the clarifying moment for me. There was that godly counsel mm-hmm. that God brings into your life, you know? And, and so I found peace, but I had to, I had to make that call and tell that special agent that in charge that recruited me that I was out. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have peace about it. But uh, he was so great, so gracious, understood. And um, uh, but in conversations over the next couple of years, it came up, hey, you know, that'd make a pretty good book, a Mm -hmm. pastor that gets recruited by the FBI. And I always loved Tom Clancy and that sort of stuff. And so, you know, I kind of kicked around the idea, well, there's not a lot of good Christian fiction out there, because let's just be honest, a lot of it is hokey and <laughs> overly preachy and just not very realistic. So I kind of wanted to do what if, what if somebody that was a pastor got recruited by the Bureau and then finds themselves in the middle of some of these crazy real world situations that theoretically could happen. And um, so I came up with a story treatment and the special agent in charge who recruited me uh, actually kind of helped. I would send him some of the stuff I was working on. He would send me back some suggestions. Uh, over the course of it, I made friends within the Bureau. I made friends at, at CIA. Uh, I've been to CIA headquarters several times. Um, the book kind of sat for about 14 years because then um, Child 3 arrived. Brandon <laughs> came on the scene. Then I started working on my doctorate. We uh, moved back to South Carolina during all the, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of kind of that transition into writing. And then the church grew. And so it was just, just a lot of things that it did have to get shelled. I finished it but just never did anything with it. And about a year and a half ago, a publisher found out about it, approached me, an independent small publisher, and said, okay, well, let's, let's do it. And they said, do you have more than one? I said, well, yeah, I had a story for the whole thing. But, but the goal in doing it was to, to have a good read, first of all, because it, as you and I both know, it, I love reading good fiction, and it's, it's tough to find time to read stuff just for pleasure. Um, most of the time I'm reading stuff on leadership yeah. or church growth or crisis counseling or any number of things. And it's tough to find something, find time to read stuff you just want to read. And the stuff I liked, you know, a lot of times it was a little too far over the line. <laughs> and, and you know, you sure didn't want your kids to pick it up and read it necessarily. So I thought, well, if I write this, I want to write it so that anybody could read it and you probably wouldn't be embarrassed for your kids to to pick it up. I mean, there's some, there's some gunplay and car chases and fist fighting and things like that to be sure. But, um, but I also wanted to, to weave the message of the gospel in there because I, I I wanted this to be not some, you know, preachy, perfect character who just always has the right spiritual answer. And it's always, you know, just seems to be in perfect lockstep with Christ as he walks. I wanted it to be someone who's struggling with, how did I get here? I was pastoring a church. I had my life figured out. And now I'm, you know, running through a a house 
outside of Monte Carlo and I'm getting shot at, you know, yeah, how yeah. did, how did these things happen? You know, and, and because in, in the course of, of all of this over the last 15 years, I've developed a lot of friends in the federal law enforcement and intelligence community and in the military who are believers who do deal with these things. Most Christians are never going to have to deal with the reality of having to draw their weapon and stop someone with it. They're never going to have to deal with the threat of, you know, somebody's being targeted for assassination. We've got to find out what they're doing, how they're planning this, how are we going to stop them? Um, and realize that you may have to take someone else's life. So I, I wanted it to have a little bit of that tension too. I wanted it to be a fun read. Huh. I wanted it to be, uh, have a little bit of the, you know, of course the, the spiritual component to it, but I also wanted to represent the struggle because every one of us as believers have that tension in our lives. What, mm. which way do I go? How do I make this decision? How, is this the right decision? Mm. What do I do now? Well, and know, so I wanted, wanted to have a little bit of that. In there too. Uh, you know, a couple of things just related to that. One is, uh, you know, I would agree the reading fiction. I'm a, I'm a leader person. I, there's always books on leadership and so on, technical books to read. And, uh, and you feel, I like fiction, but I, I, felt guilty almost like I'm, I, I don't have yeah. the time, you know, to do this, but yep. a couple of years ago, I was just really, uh, it, you know, going pretty, pretty thin, uh, just going really hard all the time. And I, I just realized I, I need to make a few changes. And so one of the things I did was just make myself at, at a certain point, just put all my workbooks aside and just read something for fun, <laughs> just rest my brain. And so I did that with your, your two books and, you know, I, I'd feel guilty just, I, I wouldn't read fiction during the day, but yeah, I mean, you know, work day, but, uh, at a certain point in the evening, I would think, okay, I've worked hard all day. I'm going to just, you know, unwind here a little bit. And so I would just pick up one of your books and I, I tell you one or two nights, I, 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 you know, I just, you, you, you write it in such a way that you get to the end of a chapter and it's like, well, I got to find out what happens next. And so the next thing I know, I'm like <laughs> an hour past my bedtime and I'm just like making myself put this book down. But, but I'm realizing that I think well, people you. need, you know, people need that, you know, they, they need to rest at times, uh, and take a break. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to read a book that, um, you can enjoy and yet it's still dealing with some issues that are, you know, important to life and uh, are fun to read. And, uh, but you know, yeah. to, maybe just one, two, uh, maybe pieces of advice. I, cause I, I, in my travels, I, I meet pastors, I meet all kinds of people, uh, business leaders who have a book in them, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, but they've got th this idea, they've been bouncing around for a while what would your advice be for people that have always thought about that? They've got a story they've been carrying around in their head for years. How do, how do you, but I have people all the time say, well, I'm, but I'm too busy to write. And so, I mean, how did you, you, you wrote this while you were working the whole time. So yeah. uh, how did you find time to write? Cause I, you know, I've written about 40 books and, uh, and I've never had just time to write. It's you, mm -hmm. you've just got to decide you're going to do it and you make the time to write. But uh, if you wait until you have time, you'll be even retirees don't have time to write. So <laughs> no. uh, So what did you do to, to get this thing on, on paper? Well, what I what I did was I kind of came up with an idea of where I wanted the story to go. And I would in the evenings, I would I started kind of with a, just the general flow layout. How do I want this to go? And then when I started writing it, that's when I would do it. I would do a lot of it after everybody kind of went to bed. I'd stay up for a couple of hours and just, just write it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I actually finished the first one at the youth camp when I was, uh, I was pastoring a church in violence in, in and Greenville. explosions all come, uh, you came to mind. While That's <laughs> where it all happened was a youth camp. And so I just went along with the students. I didn't have any responsibilities that week, but I said, I'm, I'm taking my laptop and I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And I had five days, uh, of about nine hours a day where I was able to just write. And so the first one, I was able to do that way. The second one was much more challenging. And when I wrote it last year, um, I had the, the story idea for it, but um, it was it was very different because I was writing the second one 
almost 15 years after I'd written the first one. Mm. So I had a lot of life experience. I had a lot more writing experience. I had written a doctoral dissertation by this <laughs> point. And, you know, I had done, I had done a lot of other writing. And so I, I had a little different formatting for it. But I still found that the best thing for me to do was to block off time at night. I'd come home in the afternoon, we'd eat dinner, and I would uh, sit outside and on the in the screen porch, you know, and I would, I would write, um, some nights, you know, I'd go to bed, take my laptop to bed and I'm writing in there. Mm. It, it, that was my best time to write. Mm. Uh, very rarely during the day, um, I'd get an idea for something. And so I would just, I'd reopen that file for a minute and I'd type it or I'd make an audio note for myself just to kind of get that stream of thought, if you would to pick mm. it up. But the thing about creativity, and I was a music major too. I'm a musician. I've played piano since I was in third grade. And um, and so being a musician, I, I, you know, I kind of have the little bit of the creative artist thing anyways. When you're writing fiction, it's so different from writing nonfiction, mm -hmm. like Sunday school commentary stuff I'd written or the, the dissertation, whatever the case may be. Because when it hits you, it hits you. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to act on it. It's in a way it's like sermon preparation because there've been times when I'm, I, I plan my sermons almost a year in advance. I plan the series out where I'm going to go. And so there'll be times where I'm driving down the road and something just hits me. Oh, I gotta, I gotta make a note of that. I'll pull over and make myself a note of things like that. The artistic creative process, it, it, when it hits, you kind of got to go with it. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's been one of the things for me. I've been very fortunate that that most of the time my most creative period is at night when it's quiet mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But every once in a while, something will happen. You'll get a spark. Um, the most important thing I would say is act on it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you got to get it out. And that's as I'm working on on book three now. Um, that That's kind of the way it is. You know, when you get in a run like that, you just you need to go with it. Yeah. And, uh, and I always tell people, don't be a perfectionist, you know, that, leave that, to no. your leave that to your editor. Just, you got to get the story, just get it down as rough as it is. It, yep. Once it's on paper, now you can beef it up and you can edit it and, and, and make it tighter, but, uh, you, you got to have something to work with. So get it out of your head onto paper and then yep. editors and other readers can kind of help you out, but they've got it. They can't yeah. see what's in your mind. You got to get that down first. So, and, and write what you're passionate about. I've always loved, you know, action espionage kind of things. I love cars. I'm a diehard yeah. car well, guy. You, that comes out of the book. <laughs> it comes out of the book. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, be passionate about those things, but, but do your research, you know, yeah. when you're writing about things like the FBI, CIA, secret service is going to feature prominently in the third book. Every book is sort of introducing one of the new agencies and some key characters as we kind of build toward other things in the future. You, you got to know what you're talking about. And so that was one of my goals when I wrote the first one. I mean, I had researched the Bureau enough because I'd always wanted to do it, but I would send stuff to my friend and say, Hey, how is this? Uh, when I was, when I made friends with a guy at CIA, his advice was um, you want it to be, you don't want it to be so real that it's boring because yeah. you don't want to show a stakeout for four days and all of this stuff. and But you want it to push the limits just enough that people wonder, wow, is that real? Can they really do that? Yeah. So you want to compress your time a little bit. Yeah. You want to change the technology. But but I wanted it to be so that if someone from one of those agencies picked it up, read it, they would go, oh, he knows what he's talking about. The best compliments I've gotten are from people who aren't my friends, I don't know, that are in those agencies that read it and come back and go, Okay, when's the next one? Because that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, that's um, great, and I and I know some of know, the technology that's... you use, you know, the 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 tools of the agents and so on, uh, you know, really interesting, and and um, I so I'm looking forward to it. I I want to, Marcus, just before we uh, run out of time, I I also will have all the the uh, references and and uh, in the show notes so people can find these books and order them and. 
And uh, you'll be kind of waiting like I am for volume three. We're just hoping Marcus, you know, makes the time to get it done here sooner than later. I, and I'm like you, I, most of my writing I do uh, in the evenings and on the weekends. I, you know, I've got kind of a day job at Blackview Ministries I do during the day. But, um, but in the evenings, I kind of reserve to put all that kind of stuff aside and, and write and so on. And, uh, and so there, there is time. And, I, you know, I, I realize a lot of times I'm not watching Monday Night Football. I'm at my laptop writing and you have to make some choices. But if there's a project that you've got in your heart, you, you can usually carve out time. You know, it's you just have to oh, yeah. put some and other things. Aside. And it's such a good outlet too. It's such yeah. a good way for me of of dealing with stress and things I can't do anything about. Well, I can control what happens in the story. Yeah, and, and I, so it's I, a very cathartic. You know, I think a lot of pastors, especially your public speakers, it's just healthy. I think to have your mind uh, being creative and uh, yeah. always sort of processing, always. Uh, creating and thinking and whenever the thought gets you and I've done that too I'll be out running or something and I I get an idea as soon as I, I get in the door I'm frantically writing th it down before I forget but just to be in that kind of posture where you creativity those juices are just always you know free to flow whenever that you yeah. know strikes you but but tell me just in the in the closing moments we have you are pastoring a church when you're not writing you know a thriller uh, novels and so on. And, uh, and like everybody else, uh, COVID has caught you by surprise. There's no precedent for that. Uh, but you're, you've remained uh, pretty upbeat and positive. You've had to shut things down and postpone things. And you've gotten kind of sideswiped by, uh, outbreaks of COVID down there in Florida that you hadn't counted on. And, um, what would, what would you say just as a, as a guy who's trying to you know, pastor through all of that. Uh, how, what, what advice would you give just as a leader who's trying to kind of, you know, keep your head above water, stay positive, continue to grow personally? Uh, what, what would you suggest to our listeners? The most important thing is realize where you get your power from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we're all exhausted during this time, we're all doing our best to, to lead people and lead them well, but whether you're a pastor or a leader in any way, and everyone is a leader to a certain degree. Everyone has people that look to them and follow them. If you are a, a follower of Christ, you're not doing this on your own power. I'm not doing this on my own power. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit in us to give us what we need to keep going. So that's the most important thing. Remember, we're not having to do this on our own. Mm -hmm. We're not having to do this on our own power. He's going to give us what he needs. Um, to keep our focus on the things we can do something about versus the things we have no control over. That's been one of the most frustrating things about the last year and a half. Um, I, I'm a planner. I like strategy. I like planning. I like a map. I like to know where are we going because, you know, they always say that, you know, your plan goes out the window with the first shot fired. Hmm. Um, yeah, but at least you have a plan. You got a framework that you can then just revise. You don't have to create it from the ground up. What well, one of the things about COVID has been, the plan doesn't survive, you know, the next wave, the next outbreak, mm -hmm. you know, the next news report, you know, what are they going to say next? And so it's been so frustrating because people are so divided on everything about this. They're divided on how to treat it, how to prevent it. Should I get a shot? Should I wear a mask? Should I go out in public? All of these things, people are so divided and it's been tough to lead. And that's why I think for a lot of, a lot of pastors in a ministry that become so frustrated, because we're focusing on things we have no control over. Yeah. So remember where our power comes from and focus on the things that we can actually do something about. Uh, don't, don't, don't fret over things that are beyond your scope. Focus on the things you can do. Okay. So how can we encourage people? How can we disciple people? How can we build up people? We've, we partnered last summer and just a couple of weeks ago with Advent health hospital to bring a bunch of people to the parking lot and turn our hazard flashers on uh, on a Thursday evening so that everybody in the hospital knows that we're praying for them. Hmm. We haven't forgotten you. We get police department, fire trucks, people come through with the lights and sirens on just about 30 minutes. The people in their employees and um, patients can look out the window and go, Hey, those people are thinking about us. Huh. You know, how, how do we find ways to, to build people up? How do we find ways to anger? And, and, and I'm, you know, I can ride the emotional roller coaster as much as anybody. So that's why I've, I feel better when I find ways to make someone else feel better. 
Yeah. And it's yeah. not even grand scale ministry, things like that. It's if you see somebody that's struggling with their groceries, getting the groceries in the car, take a minute and say, hey, can I help you with that? Or can I take your buggy? Yet little things interpersonally one to one can make such a huge difference in their day and in ours. You know, as pastors, we look big scale. We look at, at the you know, our church, at the church, at the country, at the world, and we get overwhelmed by that. I, I think one thing that's helped me and I would encourage others to do is move more into your personal scale. You know, remember who God is. He empowers you. Remember what the focus on the things you can do and, and to move the scale a little more intimate, a little more personal. What can I do today to encourage, to build mm-hmm. someone up, to challenge someone, to to help them to have a different perspective. Yeah. You know, and I've, I've, you know, so. I've said throughout this, behind every problem, there's always a possibility. And uh, yeah. if you focus on the, the problem, you're going to just get discouraged uh, ultimately. Mm-hmm. But uh, but look behind the problem and find the possibility. And there, there have been, and I, I know churches, I know businesses that are having record years of sales, oh, yeah. of baptisms, of growth. Uh, but what they've done is they've just, they've just made a beeline for the possibilities and new doors have opened even as other doors, older doors perhaps had closed. And, you know, I, I worked on probably four or five books, uh, last year, just because of quarantining, I had about 70 trips canceled. And so I was just home more, especially in the evenings. And so, uh, I, I could write more and I, and I just determined that rather than looking at the 70 different speaking trips that were canceled, uh, and, and feeling bad about that, I would look at all the books I had time to actually crank out and revise right. and produce. And I, I wanted to be able to show something that, that was, you know, I, I seized what opportunities there were. And so, you know, I, th- this, uh, this might be a good time too, if you're still a little bit slowed down because of some of this, uh, maybe this is the time to pull out your laptop and start writing or, or painting or whatever it is you might be doing composing, but, uh, don't get stuck with what you can't do. There's always something yeah. you can do. And so just make a beeline for that. Be productive. And maybe this is that opportunity for you to write or do something else that you've always thought you didn't have time to do before. So, uh, All right. And thinking out of the box. That's the other yeah. thing. We get stuck in our routines. And one thing that COVID has been great for, even at Oasis Church and, and Oasis, you know, we're our, already we're pretty flexible and you know, pretty mobile. We were able to, to make adjustments as we needed. But one thing that the COVID has done is it's really caused us to to not just think about, you know, because we want to be excellent with everything, but but innovation itself. And, you know, we think, okay, we may be a little cutting edge on this, but, but are we being effective? And are mm-hmm. we reaching, you know, there's so many people to be reached. Okay. So now we've got time because we have had to move this event two months forward. What else can we do? How can we make something better that we've already got? Can we focus on something that we wanted to do but couldn't? Well, now we've got a slot. It's, it's all about perspective. And that's yeah. why I think that personal creativity, that personal outlet that keeps yourself rejuvenated. It, too many times we don't take time for ourselves because we're busy. We feel guilty about reading a fiction book. We feel guilty about our hobby. We feel guilty about that. We need that yeah. to be recharged. And God gives us those things. God yeah. gives us interests and talents and abilities to use for his glory um, to draw others to him. And so I think one great thing this has done is it's given us a, a renewed sense of, hey, I need to look at how can I innovate in this? Yeah. And I, I think if there was ever a time where Christians needed to be creative, it's now. We need we need it's those now. creative juices flowing, uh, whether it's producing uh, nonfiction books or or coming up with solutions uh, for the work yeah. that we do. So, well, Marcus, thank you. I knew that our time would race by. You've got uh, so many different things that you're involved in and <laughs> we'll have in the show notes, all the ways that we'll, have a, we'll, we'll uh, put your website for your church there. And people would just like to kind yes, of know what you're thanks. doing and where you are and uh, these books as well. And, uh, and boy, I sure hope that uh, people listening today, if you've got a book that God's put in you or some other creative uh uh, work that uh, God has just been percolating in your mind for a while. Maybe this is the year to get it done. At least get started. Start writing it yep. down, and uh, Do it. and then uh, pick up these first two books of Marcus's, and uh, you'll be you'll be all caught up with the rest of us waiting for volume three to hurry up and get out. So, <laughs> so thanks, Marcus, for being with us. And uh, thank you so much. Joy to be with you. Happy Appreciate happy it. writing in these days ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. 
Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, it really makes a difference if you leave a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. We always love hearing from our listeners. So email us at podcast at blackme.org.